They tried to stop my shine, but I said, hold up. Y'all know how many hoes done tried to hold this hoe up. Tokyo Talk to music. What's up, y'all? Grammy edition. Grammy edition. Grammy edition. Grammy edition. What's up, y'all? It's here. It's fucking like 6 a.m. and shit. But, you know, I was just like, I was watching the Grammys, you know, like I'm sure a lot of you all were watching it, hate watching it or whatever way you were watching it. And I was just like, you know, I was taking notes for this week's podcast, but I'm just like, don't nobody want to hear me talk about this week's Grammys? I mean, at the end of the week, you know, might as well just go ahead and do it. Do it for the people. So that's why I'm here. Like I said, it's 6 a.m., but I'm ready. I got me a Red Bull, got me, a, um, you know, my good Gold Peak diet tea to chase that. So I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm good. So what y'all think of the show? Um... You know, I'm just going to jump right in. I don't need to introduce myself. You know me. You know I've been around. You know I do the music thing. You know you can go on rmbeing.com and read all my old shit. So, you know, let's just jump right into the shit. And, you know, I'm a positive person, so I'm not really going to focus on the stuff um, that I didn't like. I'm just going to focus on the stuff that I liked, you know. And I did think the show was shockingly more entertaining than I expected if you heard, um, you know, the... um, last podcast where I kind of made predictions about how awful it was going to be. I actually thought it was maybe because my expectations were so damn low. It was actually all right. But anyway, like I said, I'm not going to focus on the negative. Like I'm not going to talk about how like at the beginning of the show, Lady Gaga suddenly turned to try to be um, Tamar Braxton, you know, and suddenly had a brand new accent. And like somebody said on Twitter with her hands, she was like doing sign language or something. Not going to talk about that. Not gonna talk about I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on. And um, you know, I'm not even gonna talk about that long ass tribute to Neil Portnow, the um outgoing Grammy, I mean outgoing um president of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. Not gonna talk about that. You know, not gonna talk about how if you're a white person, you know you done fucked up if you need to suddenly turn out an army of black folk to vouch for you. I mean, that tribute had Jimmy Jam, had John Legend, Chloe Ann Halley, Yolanda Adams, B.B. Winans, Mother Shirley Caesar, and Andre Day, who somebody on Twitter, you know, because I was reading Twitter the whole time, somebody said she looked like a real housewife of civil rights. (laughs) So anyway, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm not going to focus on the fact that, you know, it was long as tribute to this man, but he's the one just last year said these words when somebody was um, talking about how there weren't enough women nominated in the top categories. And I quote, it has to begin with women who have the creativity in their hearts and souls. What the fuck done happened? I'm sorry, y'all. It's 6 a.m. We having technical difficulties and shit. But anyway, I'll continue with this quote. It has to begin with women who have the creativity in their hearts and souls, who want to be musicians, who want to be engineers, producers, and want to be a part of the industry on the executive level. They need to step up because I think that they would be welcome. I don't have personal experience of these kind of brick walls that you face, of course, because you're a white man, but anyway. But I think it's upon us as an industry to make them wel- to make the welcome mat very obvious. Breeding opportunities, bad word, for all people who want to be creative and paying it forward and creating that next generation of artists. I mean, the gall. It has to begin with women who have the creativity in their hearts and souls and is... There's a shortage of women in the music industry who have creativity in their hearts and souls. I mean, but then, you know, he got a, a lot of his focus was on the fact that he said that they need to step up. So then in his apology, he, and you know, not just in the initial apology, but what he was talking about for um, a long time afterwards was that he regretted those two words as if 
the step up part was the whole shit. You know what I'm saying? And that wasn't just the only kind of wrong ass thing that he did diversity wise. When somebody said like, why is there more, why aren't there more like black artists in the top categories and just all that stuff. This is what he said in 2017. Um, And I quote, we don't as musicians, in my humble opinion, listen to music based on gender or race or ethnicity. When you go to vote on a piece of music, or at least the way that I approach it, is you almost put a blindfold on and you listen. Now, first of all, in this quote that I have problems with, he says, we don't as musicians. And I'm like, first of all, is you a musician? Because, like, I went to the Wikipedia page, and Wikipedia, <laughs> this is what Wikipedia had to say about your musicianship, sis. It said, he played the bass guitar in a high school rock band, The Savages, who released, now get this, 145. And it said, the record did not achieve commercial success, but was included in a compilation of garage bands. So this man was in a band in high school, and he's coming up 2017 trying to justify things like why Beyonce's never gotten an album of the year and stuff like that by evoking that he's a musician, by looking back to his high school days. And then you say, okay, well, you know, give the man a benefit of the doubt. He's the president of, you know, the Academy and whatnot. So obviously he must have some behind the scenes of the industry experience. So, you know, I'm looking on the Wikipedia page and say, obviously this man must have some more qualifications to be running this whole shit. I mean, the whole thing that kind of is the stamp of what, like industry approval for so many artists, you know, the Grammys for better or for worse. That is what it kind of represents, you know, just like when people always say Oscar nominated or Oscar winner, you know, being Grammy nominated or Grammy award something means something, even though we all know it don't mean shit. But anyway, um, so I'm looking on the Wikipedia page. I'm saying surely this man got some like industry accomplishment shits that just like blow me away. And it says, okay, so he used, he was working at RCA and then said he moved to Jive Records where he played, and I quote, a small role in the careers of Britney Spears, NSYNC, and, well, the person who shall not be named but will be muted. But y'all know who I'm talking about. But, like, how are you going to get a job? You played a small role. So I'm like, this man ain't shit as a musician, nor is he shit as an industry exec. So he scored the gig in... um in 2002 and he's been there ever since like this is the man that decided that janet couldn't take place in the um couldn't take part in the luther vandros tribute after the gram after the super bowl thing okay this is the man who decides which r&b and hip-hop acts or categories get airtime on the show because you know we always wonder like i know this person was nominated and i know i've been sitting here for three hours but I haven't seen, you know, best R&B, best R&B song, best whatever. And he's one helping decide that. And he's also the person deciding, um, who overse- person overseeing the gender parity in the major awards. So I'm like, I did not have any time for this motherfucker tribute. I was like, here's your tribute, bitch, bye. You know, because in my opinion, what have you done for us lately or even in the past or just whatever, just go. So, but I'm not going to talk about that because that would just be negative. And like I said, I'm trying to keep it on a positive note. It's 6 a.m. We starting the day, starting the day on a good, you know, vibe. So I don't want to be negative. So I'm not even going to touch on Jennifer Lopez's Motown tribute, which was just, I mean, wrong in so many ways. I mean, Trying to be positive, y'all. Trying to be positive. But just starting, and you know, you could blame Neil Portnow's ass for that, too. I mean, because he had a hand in approving that bullshit. But anyway, I mean, just starting conceptually, there is so much wrong with it just in terms of what Motown represents and just Barry Gordy's whole dream for Motown. I mean, this is... um. I had just read this book by Jack Hamilton. It's a really good book. It's called Just Around Midnight, Rock and Roll and the Racial Imagination. And he had this to say. He said, when Barry Gordy opened Motown in 1958, 
10 years before I was born, y'all. He did so with the conviction that with the proper mix of craft and marketing, black music and musicians could be successfully packaged to white America. And his vision succeeded, as we all know, beyond anyone's wildest dreams. How, what, what does that have to do with J-Lo? What, please tell me. Like, the concept, the whole concept was that it was grounded in black music and black musicianship. And so, but people get it twisted and think that because Motown had such, you know, crossover success, that it's somehow everybody's, bu- everybody's music. Nah, it's our music that we sold to y'all. And we glad you liked it, you know, thank you, come again. But like, it is our music. And I mean, it kind of comes to brings to mind something Al Sharpton said at Aretha Franklin's funeral. You know, he was um, talking about how Trump said, you know, Trump tweeted something like, oh, I'm sad to see Aretha Franklin, whatever, what have you, because she worked for me several times. And Al Sharpton was like, she ain't work for you. She performed for you. And I mean, that's the way I feel about the Motown situation in a way. It's like the Motown's acts crossed over because they were performing for crossover audiences. But that doesn't mean crossover audiences own them and own the right to co-opt the music. And in this case, to co-opt the whole damn history. You know, so the sidebar, because I have to keep it real. And it's funny how like, Black folk, you know, like, we sometimes diss Motown among ourselves as being kind of like watered down and whatever and whatever. But let somebody try to claim it or let somebody attack it, and, you know, that's when the militant drops out real quick. It's like, we can talk about our shit, but you can't take our shit. And um, I know I'm just bringing up all these books, but it's just like I've been um, deep reading lately on music stuff, partly because of um, connections I'm trying to make for the Janet Jackson book that I'm writing. But um, I thought Margot Jefferson, the critic, um, really put it well, and she was like, we get embarrassed by Motown's easy access charm and its lack of Southern-based soul. The integration strategy looks like a shameless bid for bourgeois, rep- but for bourgeois respectability. The acting seek, the act, Child, I can say the six. It's now six oh five, y'all. Okay, but that active seeking of a white audience always arouses shame, as if it must always signal integration and self hatred. Um, ingratiation, not in- integration. Ingratiation and self hatred. Damn, I don't even have my reading glasses on. Hold on, no wonder I can't make shit sure about y'all. Anyway, um. Okay, put my reading glasses on. It's probably making noise in the headphones, but I apologize. Anyway, I'm going to read this shit again. Okay, Margot Jefferson. We get embarrassed by Motown's easy access charm and its lack of Southern-based soul. The integration strategy looks like a shameless bid for bourgeois respectability. That active seeking of a white audience always arouses shame, as if it must always signal ingratiation and self-hatred. But then we listen to his best songs, or just a lot of his good ones, and give in again. We yield to its shrewd, ebullient, ebullient pleasures, and rightly so. So, you know, I think that's very true about the Motown situation. And like I said, um, that's why I'm so heated about this J-Lo mess. And like I said, I'm not trying to focus on it, y'all. I'm not trying to... um focus. But there were two moments in the tribute that just particularly got under my skin. First of all, it's like, what in the Simone Biles was happening with all the... <laughs> was happening was when she was singing Stevie Wonder's Another Star. Like, how has... I mean, somehow Stevie Wonder has managed to perform Another Star for his whole ass career Without even doing one, you know, little, you know, those little roles you had to do in elementary school where you just tucked your head. I mean, he's been performing this song, but suddenly, you know, she feels like she has to do consecutive backflips to get through the number. 
And I'm like, what does gymnastics have to do with the Motown tribute? You trying to be Diana Ross or Dominique Dawes? What's good? Let me know. So that was just real confusing to me with all the, you know, flipping and turning and whatever. But then, okay, this this one hurts to the heart, y'all. I took particular offense when she um, tried to throw the good Tina Marie in all that fucking mess. I mean, I was like two chains. I'm going to start a riot. I'm going to start a riot. Like, and that hurt me so hard because here's the thing. It's like, Tina Marie, her name is so rarely brought up in a mainstream context. You know, and she's never given her due in the mainstream. I mean, I think Sherry Shepard had her on when on her, Sherry Shepard's birthday once on The View. But other than that, you just don't did not see Tina Marie like in those mainstream contexts. I mean, she would go on um Video Soul and kill it a cappella if I were a bell, but like so I'm just particularly protective of when she does come up in a mainstream context like the Grammys, I mean, she only got one Grammy nomination in her whole career, never an award. That when it's done the wrong way, it just bugs the fuck out of me. Because I'm like, somebody's sitting here and their first exposure to Tina Marie is this soulless, flat-ass version of Square Biz. And I feel a way. You know, because the thing about Tina Marie that just makes her so different and unique... Um, is that she didn't do black music for a come up, you know, like my girl Miley, y'all know I like Miley Cyrus, it's a problematic fave, whatever, forgive me, or like a Justin Timberlake or something like that. Tina Marie never used black music as a come up. For her, black music was a commitment, and she sacrificed for that shit. Like, she could have gone more mainstream and stuff, but she did what she had to do because she was true to the music. And she was true to the music because the music was true to who she was, was true to her whole identity and how she saw herself and how she saw her community and how she saw how she was connected to the world. And so, like, I just feel like, you know, that has to be represented in a certain kind of way. I mean, because she was like... Like like all black artists in that crossed over in the eighties, it's like other than like the Michael Jackson's web, you know, she got her one good crossover eighties hit, you know, Love a Girl hit and whatever. That was her version of like Shaka's I Feel for You or Patty's New Attitude or Niecy's Let's Hear It for the Boy. You know, she got that one good hit. And then the thing that I respect so much about that is that, you know, after the success of Love a Girl, she didn't go making her music more pop. Or anything, you know, she took that brief mainstream, you know, shine that she got to then make one of the most experimental albums of her career. And one of my faves, you know, the the highly conceptual Emerald City. And it turned out that that was the worst seller of her entire career. But, you know, like me, Lenny Kravitz has good taste, and Lenny Kravitz thinks it's one of her best. No, Lenny Kravitz thinks it is her. It is her best, and it had just has so many epic joints. Like, well, don't stop listening to me, but after you listen, you know, go on stream like "Love Me Down Easy," "Shangri La," and then like "You So Heavy" with the sparkle reference. Sister can't fly on only one wing, you know, um, and then like. Lips to find you and like and real talk. Um, junior year of high school, I got sent to the principal's office because I took out a good old number two in English class and wrote on the desk, um, my desk, the opening. It was one of them desks, you know, the desk you slide into, like it had like a wooden top. Probably not real wood though. Probably like that. It was that, you know, I don't know whatever kind of wood that was, but anyway, you could write on it. And I wrote, you know, the opening the Let's find you. So you say you're leaving for the southern tip of Spain to soak up local color and forget my name, to live inside the major, not the minor chord, and forget how we made love in a 57 Ford that was worth getting detention for. Poetry. And it was in English class, so it was apt. But anyway, um, I was just like, and you know what also is disappointing to me is that, and sorry, this is probably going to make noise, but I need to adjust my headphones. They've fallen off my ears. But you know, when the show started, J-Lo actually 
even though she was wearing a hat that was damn near touching her upper lip, you know, J-Lo actually really inspired me because she started talking about the influence that freestyle music had on her. Or back in the day, we actually, we didn't really call it freestyle till later when there was more of a split, when hip hop was kind of doing its own thing. But back in the day, we used to call it Latin hip hop. And, you know, I thought that was so cool of her because nobody ever mentions freestyle and how influential it was. And like for me personally, I mean, before I started really moving toward house music in my club taste, I mean, I was a freestyle fanatic. Like I was, I mean, people think I'm Latin, Latino anyway, I'm not. But, you know, I was like a fool, like driving up from D.C. You know, it was me at the heartthrob where the old fun house was, where Jelly Bean um, Benitez used to play. But at the um, heartthrob, it was Little Louis Vega. And, you know, it was me losing my shit. He would play like the big dance dub of Dan Hartman's Name of the Game. Google it. Um, or the instrumental to Auto Man by Nucleus. You know, and then and it was just an experience. Like, it was very different from the club experiences that I've had since then. Because it was just like, just energy, just raw and just young and just wild. And like, they would play like... Um, they would have like red flashing lights turn around like it's like an emergency vehicle or something like that. And I was 18 or 19, you know, full of rage, wanted to fight. And freestyle was like fight music to me. Like I could not get fucking get enough. So like during this musical, during this lame Motown tribute, I'm thinking like rather than Jack and Motown, she would have been better to use her star power to shed light on the Latin artists behind the whole freestyle movement. Folks that probably never got any nominations for anything, you know. I mean, she could have given it up for Lisa Lisa, you know, the cover girls, Because of You was one of my faves. Uh, Sweet Sensation, Sweet Sensation, first album. Sweet Sensation was like, they was like the SWV of freestyle. I mean, they were hardcore with it. Like I said, the first album. Then they got pop because I think the um, the child that could really sing aggressive, like, she, I don't know, she left the group, got thrown out, whatever. But anyway, Sweet Sensation first album. They were like raw with it. Giggles, who can forget Love Letter? Probably all y'all, because you probably never knew it in the first place, but that was the shit. Uh, Judy Torres, I love me some Judy Torres. No Reason to Cry. Uh, Fascination. And um, Sapphire, like literally, she's one of the handful of artists including Shaka Khan. Like, I really can't think of more than those two, <laughs> honestly, that I've ever asked for an autograph. So that's how shook I was. And see, the importance of J-Lo doing that is she could have really reclaimed the narrative and recentered the pop narrative around them because the truth is that freestyle artists were very influential to mainstream 80s top 40, but have gotten completely erased from the narrative because all the female pop um, women of the 80s like has some kind of freestyle influence like you take Madonna you can hear it in like the you can dance remix you can hear the freestyle influence even in song like white heat you take a Deb Debbie Gibson the only in my dreams that was nothing but freestyle I mean I think little Louis Vega even um remixed that and then you know and even somebody like Janet I mean the um I can't remember which, which mix of When I Think of You, but one of the 12 inches mixes, like, it's not, not nothing but freestyle. It's like Archie Bell and the Drells meets uh, Latin hip hop. So it just would have been such an important statement for J Lo to kind of claim that, but she ain't do it and whatever missed the opportunity. And like I said, I don't want to focus on the negative, so I'm moving on. Now, here's just some of the positive things I just thought, some shout-outs, just things I just thought, you know, was nice to see. Uh, James Blake, one of my faves, you know, harmonizing with Philip Bailey. I mean, that was a fucking moment because um, James Blake has, like, one of my favorite albums of the year. It's just such a, like, it's such a, like, statement on just a unique way of putting, like, being in that position where you didn't think that love was possible for yourself and then you find love and like 
it really being a fucking surprise because you really have reconciled yourself to just not finding love. Like, not even from a lonely point of view or anything like that, but just like, just that's what it is. And I have other shit on my mind. And that's just what I do. And he even has one line about like how he thought that the song was going to be more important than you know, the woman he fell in love with, but he realized that's not true. So it's just, I'm going on, but it's just a wonderful fucking album. So, um, and of course I can't even rip in the name of it. Let me see. And it's brand fucking new. Um, let me see. James Blake. And I'm going to see him next weekend, y'all. I'm going to the Three Points Festival. I'm going to see him. I'm going to talk about this uh, probably not next week because I'll be it. But I'm going to Three Points, of, like a festival in Miami because don't nobody come to Miami because it's too far down. So we have like Three Points Festival where we get to see cool people. So I'm going. I'm seeing James Blake. I'm seeing Erica Badu. I'm seeing SZA. I'm seeing uh, Raekwon and Ghostface. Um I think like ASAP Rocky, so, some other people too. So I'm very excited about that. But anyway, one of the people I'm most excited about is James Blake. Okay, the album is called Assume Form. So you definitely should check that out. But just him with the God, Philip Bailey, like that was just amazing to me. And I'm just thinking like, I just want, I want more. Like I want them harmonizing together on reasons, like the live re- reasons versions with the old heads know what I'm talking about. That boo doo doo, boo boo doo. You know <laughs> I know some of y'all gonna think I'm crazy, but some of y'all know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. Boo-doo-boo-boo-doo. I want I want to hear them do that. So um somebody make that happen. Maybe the BET, but that'd be hot to do it at the BET Awards, you know. But anyway, um shout out Janelle Monet for looking like a black Judy Jetson with the safe word. Shout out to that. That was a moment. Um shout out to Valerie Simpson sitting in the audience with her white on just looking just good and like accomplished and established and just her you know what I mean and just both forgetting the trustees award with her um late husband Nick and honestly just for simply being Valerie Simpson like I think one Ashford and Simpson were so great but like one unfortunate consequence of that was that it took it didn't allow Valerie Simpson to establish her solo career. And she was really a phenomenal, she is, was, whatever, a phenomenal force just of herself. Like one time I saw her perform, just sit, sit, sitting there with a the piano at um, one of Cheryl Lee Ralph's Diva Simply Singing events um, that she does like as an aid, for AIDS charities. And I mean, it was just incredible. She just sat at the piano and did all the stuff that she had written but in her own voice and just kind of seeing how she how she initially had interpreted the songs like she just sat there she did I'm Every Woman she did um, The Boss I mean it's just thing after thing after thing and it was just amazing and please like her album Exposed that's one of my favorite albums of all time so again don't turn me off yet but after you listen to me, then you listen to James Blake. Well, maybe, but even before you listen to James Blake, or I don't know, maybe if you don't even listen to James Blake. But anyway, you should check out um, Exposed because it's on all your streaming sites. And it's just really um, just an incredible um, sort of kind of just like a, a 70s soul record that's really stripped down and kind of um, bare. So it's, it's fantastic. Um Shout out to Diana Ross for just being Diana Ross and for saying happy birthday to me on her 75th. You know, and everybody, like, everybody, you know, thought that was a fierce diva moment and everything like that, self-love, and it was. But, I mean, we also can't take away from, like, the seriousness that's behind that in a way because, you know, Diana's only two years younger than Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin ain't here no more. You know, so it's like, it really means something. It's not just a kind of diva, me, me, me moment for her to say something like, happy birthday to me. It's really like, happy damn birthday to me, because I'm still here. And a lot of people that I came up with ain't. So I just, I really kind of felt that moment, especially in the context of um, the Aretha Franklin tribute, you know, that came later. Um, 
And then shout out to just her performing the best years of my life, um, which you may know as the first single from her box set. Remember the box set? From her box sets, Forever Diana musical memoirs. Uh, but anyway, that song, which was produced by the legend Nick Martinelli, like it did nothing on the charts. Nothing. But Miss Diana Ross will tell you what is and was not a hit. <laughs> like, because she's been performing that shit like it was a smash since 1993. And this really on a side note, but whatever, that's me. Um, it also has a beautiful video done by Ellen Van Unworth. So you should check out that video because, especially for the Jam fam on here, because it's very similar in look and feel to the shoot that um, Ellen Van Unworth did with Janet you know, which some, one of the pictures ended up on the if cover, um, the single, the if single cover. So that was, um, really great. And then related to Diana, shout out to Rhonda Ross on her iPhone. Cause that picture of Rhonda on her iPhone, I think that's destined for meme history. Cause I mean, just from the moment I saw it, a lot of people immediately associated with J-Lo because it's like, the moment I saw it, I thought of 50 bazillion uses that I can have that in the future. I immediately saved that to my meme file on my um, Mac, you know, just for later use. Shout out to Barty for giving us Cotton Club realness during the money performance. Although, I thought the whole issue with Ariana was that they didn't want nobody singing new songs that aren't nominated. So I was confused. But anyway... It was a great performance, and um, also for her being the first woman to win Best Rap Album, shout out to her. And lastly, shout out to Ariana Grande, who got all the revenge during the commercial breaks. It's like, Neil, oh, and whoever else, you know, um, said that she couldn't perform her new shit on the show. So what did she do? She got an Apple commercial that played almost the whole goddamn seven rings including the the rap part so it's like what she need for the show she got that and then i thought that that was badass enough you know later she did the same thing with t-mobile that played almost all the thank you next so you know take that grammys now moving on to um my top five minutes hold on i need to take me a sip of my gold peak diet tea y'all know i'm trying to get that sponsorship right All right, um, and I'm doing it in reverse order. So my top five Grammy moments. Okay, number five, um, you know, I always have to give it up for Dolly Parton. I cannot remember a time that I haven't been obsessed with her. It's kind of like Cher to me or Diana Ross, you know, just people. I'm sorry about that. I know that made a noise. But just people that, like, for as long as I've know me and had a sense of me and had a sense of I guess an aesthetic you know when you start to develop a consciousness of the things that you like that then come to define you I mean she was always in the mix and one of my career highlights um was actually interviewing her at Dollywood I mean it was not even like a lot of people think of her as camp and funny, like, it was not at that at all. I almost thought it was. Like, I thought I was going to get, like, you know, I don't know, a big boobs mug or something like that. Or, like, you know, there'd be some rides where you were, like, some roller coaster where you were going up and down titties or something like that. I didn't know what to expect, honestly. But, I mean, it was a really deep experience. Like, it was really rooted in the community. I mean, she had, like, local crafts people. There wasn't a whole lot of, like, there wasn't any, you know anything there that was not rooted in the local crafts people you know the just um every all the rods were kind of like wooden and everything it was very integrated within the kind of um mountainous environment like it was really it was deep you know it was it wasn't anything kind of superficial or flashy about it like it was really and like going through her she has a little museum and going through it um, and seeing like the momentum from her career, you really got a sense of the depth of what this woman has done and like how significant her journey 
was. And I remember looking at the coat of many colors, you know, thinking it was going to look like some threadbare thing. That looked like a fly piece, you know, from the 90s that Todd Open made or something that Tyra Banks was walking down the runway. That thing looked fly as hell. So anyway, it was just a great experience. And I love the tribute, um, especially my problematic fave, Miley, you know, Katy Perry, not so much. I, I didn't Katy Perry just recently say that she was going away for a while, that she was taking a break? Uh, too soon, sis. Too soon. <laughs> let us miss you if that's ever going to happen, but let us even have the chance to, like, want to hear uh, fireworks or something like that. But, like, it doesn't feel like you went away. Uh, and I think I just saw my timeline, like, heard on a paper magazine cover. And the Anyway, but um, the one thing that bothered me about the um, Dolly Parton tribute, especially me being a black Dolly Parton fan, is that there were no black artists included in um, the tribute. And, you know, one thing I think that's interesting about Dolly, too, is that her career trajectory was similar to a lot of black artists that achieved crossover success, you know, Pre the 90s, when everything was changed in the 90s in terms of what was and what wasn't considered pop. But pre the 90s, you know, you as a black artist, as an R&B artist, you really took, could take a hit for um, going mainstream. Like we saw when, like, when Whitney was booed at the Soul Train Music Awards. I mean, some said that she was never that she never recovered from that, that that was something she took with her to the grave. And, like, you even think of somebody like maybe, like, the late James Ingram, you know, rest in peace. He, you know, I mean, he was really kind of seen in that pop lane, you know. He tried to come back to R&B charts with, like, what was it? It's Real, I'm Real, I think it was produced by Teddy Riley or something like that. But it's, like, he never kind of fully came back to be considered an R&B artist once he had all those, you know, I don't have the heart and all those big crossover ballads. So the, I'm just saying that there was a price to pay. And so the interesting thing to me was that the Dolly tribute opened with Here You Come Again. And like that song was like the turning point for her in her slowly losing her support at country radio because even though that was a huge smash of country and pop and it was like her biggest seller it like led to the perception that she was no longer country or didn't want to be country um anymore and that shit lasted a long time like when i was doing um my dolly pardon story and we're talking like what oh two oh three or something like that I, you know, talked to the local, I was in Atlanta, and I talked to the local um, country radio program, and just, you know, the obligatory, oh, well, what do you think of the new Dolly Parton single? Are y'all playing it? This and that, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, well, Dolly conveniently forgets that she turned her back on the country industry to go Hollywood. And I'm just like, like, you, I, like, hating on the woman for being a success i mean if we're like because the go hollywood i don't think was just a reference to you know the movies like nine to five and you know i haven't fucked with straight talk but um you know it's like that sense that she went country and i always love um something that she her kind of comeback to that she wrote it in um her autobiography she she said um I would hear some of the old timers in Nashville complain that I was leaving country music. I would always reply, I'm not leaving it. I'm taking it with me to new places. So that's how gangster she was with that. So again, you know, you could really sub that story in for, I mean, that's probably what Whitney would have said, right? You know, you can really sub that story in for a lot of black artists. And then the other thing is that she actually has a connection with a lot of black artists. I mean, Millie Jackson and Patti LaBelle both covered Here You Come Again. And just on the soundtrack for um, for Dumpling, you know, which regrettably I haven't seen, I feel bad I haven't seen it because come Christmas time, I had to decide whether I was going to watch Dumpling or Bird Box and everybody on social media was talking about Bird Box, so I watched Bird Box, which I like, but I'm just saying, I ne just never swung back to Dumpling. 
But nevertheless, um, you know, on the Dumpling soundtrack, she has features from Macy Gray and Mavis Staples. So either one of them could have been on there. And then I was thinking to myself, like, was Priscilla Renee booked? Because we really need to start supporting Priscilla Renee's solo country shit after all the pop and R&B bops that she's co-written for us. I think we need to return the favor because she's given us MJ Blee's, um Mary J. Blige's Don't Mind. She's given us Fifth Harmony's Worth It, Kelly Clarkson's Love So Soft, which I have to stop myself from breaking into right now. And most recently, um, Mariah's a no-no. So go on, go ahead and stream a sister. You know, show her some support. And that includes myself, because I ain't never played any for solo stuff. But, you know, I know it's out there, and I know I should, and I will. Um, and then, like, I liked Little Big Town doing Red Shoes on the song Red Shoes. But then I was like, imagine if... Instead of Little Big Town, it was like the Clark Sisters. Like, that would have been epic. And for one thing, you know, Dolly started to get into her little happy dance on um, at the end of the song, but then she stopped. It wouldn't have stopped if the Clark Sisters had been there. They would have carried on. Like, it would have been church up in there. So, again, nice tribute, but missed opportunities. So, moving on. My number four favorite moment was Shawn Mendes and again, my problematic fave Miley Cyrus doing In My Blood. I mean, first of all, I bid Mendez Army, hashtag Mendez Army, from way back, back to the Cameron Dallas is my boyfriend days. Google it. And um, and no, I don't think he's gay or that if he were gay, that he would necessarily be a bottom. I just like his voice, his commitment to his craft, his overall energy, his cute as fuckness. Um, and don't fight it. I mean, I've converted a number of people to the Shawn Mendes fandom by now. I'm like a Scientologist with the shit. You know, just watch his episode of Carpool Karaoke. Get into it. You can't resist. But anyway, the performance started out sexy as fuck with him. You know, I thought the sexiness had just was, you know, peaking when, um, interesting choice of words. But anyway, was just peaking <laughs> during the MTV performance with the rain showering down him and he's in the white t-shirt and water and singing and but anyway but then you know he started this performance that sleeveless thing his arms flexing you know the little muscles just poking out while he's playing the piano and ooh, boop -a -doo, boop -a -doo. and then but then he got up and one hand with one hand slung that guitar around his neck I swear I had 11 children like, I was done. I was like, boom, 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 boom. That was this, like some sexy ass shit. But then M Miley came in and the harmonics of it all and just, mm, 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 mm. I was, I was just done. Like they, the two have so much chemistry. It's ridiculous. And if you haven't seen it, you should Google. Um, they did Islands in the Stream together a couple of nights before that. Or maybe just the night before, at the Dolly tribute at the Music Hairs benefit. And, you know, they got so much chemistry, but they almost have so much chemistry that it got me a little worried because, you know, Miley is a married woman now. And, you know, it's like when they were doing, um, when they were doing Islands of the Stream, like she leaned in a little too good when they had that line making love to one another. I'm like, you know, it's that lean in, like, we sing in a duet together. So, yeah, you know, pretend we're whatever, whatever. And then there's that lean where it's like, mm, she really think about making love to this motherfucker. So, <laughs> like, um, and the thing is, Molly ain't been married but a couple of months. She got married in December. And she's already out there, like, on extra. She was admitting that she was the one that reached out to Sean about collaborating. And she did it by sliding in his DMs. I mean, if I was her husband, I'd be like, you know, that's what managers are for. Like, that's you have your guy call his guy or woman, whatever, and get it done. You don't be sliding in homeboys' DMs talking about, let's make music together. But that's just me. Oh, and then they also wore matching leather jackets to the Music Cares event, 
And now, this is what she said to Extra. Like, this was Extra TV, not, I mean, she was being Extra on Extra, in my opinion. But she said, I know I'm married, but I get crazy when I see a photo of Sean. And then she went on, he's not a hall pass. I just get to look. I don't need to touch. I just look. Girl, if you're thinking that deep about looking, then you only but a half step away from one to touch. And, like, I'm just like, she's my girl and all, but I don't want her to fuck up my good Sean's clean-cut image, you know, because... I'm just saying it only is gonna take one late night studio session and one thing less another and boom but the oomp boom boom. You know, and then the thing also is, um, you know, Sean has got to be vulnerable after last year because Homeboy took um Haley Baldwin to the Met Gala in May, and that was kind of, you know, one of his first times stepping out with somebody like, you know, like kind of like um relationship in somebody and then child Haley was married to Justin Bieber by September <laughs> so it's like that is God that's insert the Friday's damn gift you know there's no way to kind of not take that a certain kind of way so I'm just saying he's vulnerable and they late night and they're singing it's together and there's harmonies boom 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 Somebody better get him one of the male chastity belts and just lock up that Canadian dick because <laughs> it's just going to be a problem if uh, <laughs> if uh, that were to happen. So I just don't want to see that happen. So like like I said, get that chastity belt, lock up that dick. Um, moving on to number three, but keeping with the theme of fine ass motherfuckers. Why did nobody tell me about the black country singer Kane Brown? Because, like, I like country, and I like fine-ass men, and, like, you put the shit together, like, let me know. Because I was watching E, because I know he's been around. I know I'm late as fuck, but, like, I ain't know. I just ain't know. Because I was watching E's Red Carpet, and, you know, I was taking notes for this podcast, right? He came on the screen. I dropped my motherfucking pen. I was just like, who is that? Then, of course, I spent the next 60 minutes, you know, pre-Grammys, watching his YouTube videos, Googling, you know, Kane Brown shirtless, sh- uh, shopping for merch, and um, reading all these articles about him. And he really has an interesting story. I mean, because he's, you know, mixed race. And, like, he was telling stories about, like, literally running from his, running for his life from people chasing him, you know, saying nah, with the hard R. You know what I mean? And like um and then he said and this was just so deep, like in terms of like black folk can fuck with country music, but does country music fuck with us? Cause he said that when he first got to Nashville, people straight up did not want to write with him because he was black. And you know, that's just kind of crazy so again i'm kind of hooked on him i'm obsessed so whatever expect to hear about him more in future um podcasts because he's got that like deep josh turner scotty mccreary voice and like he talks that country slang that east coast boys we like so (laughs) you know that's my man now uh number two gotta give it up for my man aubrey Showing up with a surprise award acceptance appearance. Shout out, you know. And then he really came through with the speech. Although it got cut off. You know, I really thought he delivered. Sorry, y'all. My note cards are stuck together. So Anyway, but he said, this is what I liked in the um, speech. He said, sometimes it's up to a bunch of people who may not understand what a mixed in terms of getting awards, sometimes who decides who gets the awards or even the nominations, honestly. 
um, may not understand what a mixed race kid from Canada has to say or a fly Spanish girl from New York or anybody else. And then he goes on, he says, the point is, you've already won if you have people who are singing your songs word for word, if you are a hero in your hometown, if there are people who have regular jobs, who are out in the rain, in the snow, spending their hard-earned money to buy tickets to your shows, you've already won. And I mean, I think that's an important principle just in general to as an artist and something just to kind of keep in mind about the importance of people that support you um, and kind of, you know, really respecting that and feeling that the same way that you feel when your industry peers give you accolades, you know, and of course everybody wants accolades from their peers and stuff, but I think it's particularly important for um, black creatives or, um, I'm not going to span the shit. I'm, I'm black. I'm just talking about black people. So I'm just saying black creatives. Um, because it reminds me of something that Ava DuVernay said on Justin Simeon. You know Justin Simeon from um, the creator of um, Dear White People. He has this podcast called Don't At Me. It's a really good podcast. Again, after you listen to James Blake, you play Valerie Simpson's Exposed. You give Priscilla Renee a couple of good spins. Um, get her numbers up. <laughs> you know, listen to Justin's podcast, um, Don't At Me. Because one thing, Ava, she's talking about Emmy nominations because Dear White People, you know, which is on Netflix, didn't get any Emmy nominations. And Justin Simeon had really, really tried. Like, that was his goal with the second season, which was fantastic, by the way, if you haven't watched it, that really, some of them episodes. But anyway, um, so they were talking about him not giving nominations. And Ava was saying, like, it's important you have to feel the same way about the people that come up to you and show you love about your work. You have to feel the same way about that as you do about getting these awards and getting these awards um, nominations. And, you know, that is really, that's very, I can honestly say that that's sort of, you know, way before this, but just from my personal experience, I had something that was really life-changing for me artistically that happened with um my Luther Vandross biography like that in that um you know when it was initially released some people thought thought it you know because everybody's so protective of Luther whatever like some people thought it was me trying to like be tabloidy or like trying to out him or just trying to like capitalize on him as if I didn't grow up with Luther Vandross you know just all this kind of stuff like that came at me like once, and it's just weird shit. Like one time, um, you know, I guess I had overcorrected the code switch or something, but you know, because I came up in a certain way, and you're supposed to talk a certain way when you're on pub, you know, public. Obviously, I don't give a fuck about that now, but you know, that's the way I kind of grew up. And so one time, I was doing this radio interview about Luther when the book came out, and. This man, this was on a, like a, this was an R&B station. This man stopped me mid sentence and was like, "Excuse me, I just have to ask, are you black? Because what are you doing writing a Luther Vandross bio? As if like the way I talk had something to do with my authenticity for writing about Luther. So I had all sorts of really bizarre shit like that happening um, at the very beginning. So I it." And then I was covering his funeral for um, Vibe. And like, again, just the whole perception of the tabloid thing or whatever. Like, I got blacklisted from, they wouldn't, I walked to the front door and I was on the media list because I knew the person that, you know, just from my old connections, I knew the person that was putting together the media list. So I was on the media list. So I could stroll up and like, Craig Seymour, you know, I'm on the list, the DJ's list. <laughs> Shout out to Little Louie, but no just saying I was on the list and um then somebody just within earshot of that somebody as part of his camp just came over and said no he's not allowed in uh, by any circumstances look at me dead ass in the face you know so I was just like whatever because it was a public fucking viewing so what I do I just walked around the block and got in the line with everybody else and just stood in the line and was in and out in 30 minutes but one of the things that happened, like, as soon as I turned that corner, you know, as soon as I had this humiliation, because everybody was like, ah, you know, he ain't get in. 
as soon as I turned the corner, I saw this woman holding my book and like clutching it like in such a way it was like that was her connection to Luther or something and like she felt like it was like a physical embrace of the book and it was just so it struck me so deep because I was like you know that's why I wrote the book like I wrote the book for true Luther fans like I'm a Luther fan and like this woman none of these other motherfuckers get it Okay, and people asking, am I black enough to write the fucking book on radio? You know, none of these motherfuckers get it. This woman gets it. This woman's holding my book, cradling my fucking book. And that just changed my whole attitude because you couldn't say shit to me then. Fuck you. You know, I know I did it. I know this one woman knows why I did it and gets why I did it. And I know that she does. It's not just her. She represents Oh, people I just can't even see. So fuck you. You can't say shit to me about this book because I know that people get it. So um, and then, you know, of course, as things do, just with universal laws and whatnot. After that, I began getting all these accolades. People began liking it and everything like that. And it's only continued to this day. But that was the real turning point for me. So I'm going on for too long. But just all that to say that I was really connected to what um, Drake said at that moment. And, you know, another thing that Ava said that during that thing that was kind of related to the Drake thing that really struck with me, stuck with me, struck me and stuck with me, um, was she was saying, like, you know, if you're really out there and you're talking and your work is speaking to a very specific community that's outside the mainstream community— you're not going to get nominations and awards, like, because they just not going to get it. Like, if you're speaking so specific to to that community and you're really doing that shit that you know that people get, the mainstream that decide on these awards and shit, they're not going to get it because it's not for them. So don't be upset about something that you put out there. You wrote it. For this community, you ain't write it for the mainstream. So don't get upset if the mainstream don't get it. So, I mean, I just think that's a really important thing to um, keep in mind. And that's something. So I just thought Drake was really, really strong with, you know, he gets a lot of flack and stuff. I've always been a Drake fan, still a Drake fan. But, you know, he gets a lot of flack for just whatever, just being light-skinned Canadian and whatever. I don't know. But, um soft, you know, half singing, half rapping, but whatever, you know, he gets a lot of shit for a lot of shit, but I just thought he really came through in that moment. Um, and now moving on to my number one, number one Grammy moment of the night. We damn near seven o'clock here, but it got to number one. Uh, I have to give it to Chloe and Hallie. Like doing the um, great Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack duet, Where's the Love? Not only when it was it one of the best performances that I've ever seen um, in recent years, or ever, or whatever, uh, but it was exactly what you want from a great award show performance. I feel like a great award show performance, like if you're taking it back to like, well, not really taking it back, well, it is taking it back, but like, you know, the Ricky... Um, the Ricky Martin performance, you know, just performances, any number of Beyonce performances, like when she had that dove land in her hand, you know, just it should be something that kind of, if you're not, have not been into that person, is something that really makes you see them and recognize them as an artist in a way that you may have never done before. And if you have been following that person, it actually expands your, um, view of the expands the possibilities of what you think that that person is capable of artistically and to me um chloe and hallie did all that everything was right the outfits the lighting the staging the harmonies the um singing together and even like when um chloe's low notes and hallie's highs and I love the track. It, the track really brought to mind like some of the darker moments on Beyonce's self-title. Like it had kind of that, um, just a, that that feel that really kind of it just kind of gave like a depth to this weird love. And I I just thought it was just fantastic. And um, 
you know, I'm going to need this to be a single or at the very least some kind of title exclusive or something. I just thought it was that. And I thought the performance once again proves a lot about Beyonce. Like it really shows her focus because, you know, with Parkwood, she has, it's not like she has, you know, 50 bazillion acts out there. It's like she chose them and just really focused on them and polishing them to be competitive with the best of the, in the industry, regardless of what, how, what their sales are. You know what I mean? Like they are beyond sales, but not in a bad way, but like they have are elevated to an artistry that it doesn't matter if they have a top 10 hit or anything like that. It's like people already recognize the talent and the artistry and everything like that. And that's a really good place to be in, especially like right after your first album. That's pretty incredible. And I think that's all due to Beyonce and the way that she has engineered her career to be above the charts, you know, um, and not thinking about radio programmers. Um, they say speed it up, she just goes slower, you know what I mean? But um, the other thing just shows me, like, what a visionary Beyonce is, because I have to admit, like, I always appreciated what Chloe and Hallie were about, but I wasn't, like, really trying to listen to their stuff. I mean, I remember that one mixtape they released on SoundCloud and was, like, 45 continuous minutes or something. I was like five minutes in, I was just like, you know what? I'm just got to wait till they put an album or separate these tracks because I just I can't commit to that level. But now with you know, I just love them on Grownish. They're um, series regulars now, and they just crack me up. Um, especially Hallie with her, you know. And then this performance. I mean, I'm a total stand now, and I really can fully appreciate what Beyonce must have seen or felt in the first place. So, again, like I said, stuff like that, these five moments, my shout-outs, it made it a much more enjoyable experience than I initially expected or that I certainly thought after seeing that Camila Cabello mess um, that opened the show. Which, did that, was that me, or did that just not look like they basically just did the same production design from Rihanna and Khaled's performance last year. And just, I mean, it seemed like the same colors, the same kind of costume. So whack. But um, anyway, that's about it. I'm not going to do a long wrap up because we down there seven o'clock now. I thank you all as always for listening. If you like what you hear in all the crazy randomness, please share it. That means a lot. And I'll be back with another episode very, very soon at the end of the week. And as always, be cool, be kind, be creative, be your motherfucking self. Because I love y'all. I'm out, Craig.